All right, our scripture this morning is coming from Genesis 12, verses 1 through 4. Listen now to the word of God. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out for Haran. This is the word of God. All right, we are continuing along on to our, our covenant series, which has actually been going on now for, for about seven weeks. But this is kind of like, this is kind of like the mini-series, like the, the Discovery Channel mini-series of this. So um, we're on week three of our mini-series. So if you recall last week, we talked about Adam and Eve in the garden and how paradise had been given to them. And of course, we all know that there was a fall. And because of the fall, Adam and Eve were ashamed. So they hid their sin. They covered themselves up with fig leaves. And they hid in the garden, afraid to confront their sins, their, their things that they have done wrong. This led to a, a devastating consequences of, of sin that would spread across all generations. That soon all of us would rebel against God. It's something we're born with. We're born with this natural instinct to go against God. This would lead to worldwide floods. This would lead to, to the confusing languages at Babel. This would lead to, to years and years and years of, of God's judgment and sin and those consequences that would happen because of man's sin. But in all of this, there is a connection to where we get our covenant. The covenant that we so graciously rejoice in today. So you think, how can, can man and woman go from, from paradise to sin to rejoicing in a covenant? And all of this becomes God's greater plan revealed for us. All of this would start a covenant. If you don't know what a covenant is, a covenant is a promise given to us. So in all of this, God gave us a promise that Abram, who would become Abraham, would be filled with God's blessings. That not only Abraham and Sarah, his wife, would be filled with blessings, but all of their generations to come, all of the peoples of his nation would be blessed. Because of this, God gave Abram a task. And without question, without asking God what that task would even be, he faithfully said yes. He faithfully responded to the task that was given to him. And that is how we get into our covenant picture. So that is a, a brief synopsis on, on how we get to where we are today. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on in our scripture reading for this morning. We met a man named Abram. And like I said, like this is a confusing part of Scripture. Like, like women in here who are married, you've had a, a, a last name change, right? Your maiden name to the, your married name. But it's not too often in here we have a significant event in life that, that changes our first name. Now, now I changed my, my legal name's Dustin, and I go by Dusty because there was three Dustins in my class, and I just became Dusty for some reason. We change our names that way. We have, we have aliases. In, in small towns, Stickney, South Dakota, everybody had a nickname. Now, in Little Rock, I'm beginning to see there, there's nicknames out there. But everyone in, in small town, Stickney, had a nickname. But we didn't change our name. We had an alias. So here's Abram, and all of a sudden, we have Abraham. We have Sari. And now we have Sarah. And it gets a little bit confusing every time Scripture does this. So I kind of want to explain on, on what this is meaning. So Abram, the first time he meets God is, is, is Abram, which in Hebrew means father. Which is kind of interesting because Abram at this time is 75 years of age, right? Now, now you don't have to raise your hand, but, but raise your hand if you're around that 75 area, like if you want. All right, a few of you. 
So now, now here's where I'm going to go have you all go in crisis mode. So you're around that 75 years of age, and, um, and God appears to you and says, Servant, you're going to have a child at 75 years of age. So now Abram, which means father, has become fathers of many. Father of many. That's what Abraham means. So because God gave Abram a promise to have many, to be blessed with many things, now his name was changed to be father of many. And that's why, that's why we're, we're having this name change. So Abraham now is around the age of 75, and he has just been told by God, a guy he's never met, a guy he knows little about. Now, if you want to get real technical in here, Abraham would be the first Jew. So a guy that doesn't really know a lot about God, but will know faithfully a lot about God in the coming days, in the coming months, in the coming 100 years that he will live, meets God for the first time, and now God has told this 75-year-old man that he is going to have his firstborn child. Imagine that, my, my 70-year-old friends. If, if that would happen to you, you would be in shock. You would be in awe. Now remember, Abraham lived to be 175, so, so now imagine living to be 175. I don't know which one would be more of a shock to me. But Abram was an ordinary man. He was a man who, who just went about his day and he did his tasks and he lived his simple life. And he came from an ordinary family. He didn't come from this, this bloodline that, that we would say is directly related to, to kings and queens. He was an ordinary man who was called for a much higher living than anything we can ever imagine who was called to, to live and build this nation for the next hundred years that he would live. He was called to a promise, to a covenant, that would directly relate to us still to this day. The promise wasn't that he would just change his name and he would have kids and those kids would do awesome things. But the promise was bigger than that. God told him to pack all of his things up, to take his wife, to leave his family, to leave his friends, to, to leave everything that he had built. Leave it all behind and follow. And he had a choice. He had a choice that he could either stay in his comfortable place, the place that he had always known as home, or he could pick it all up and he could follow God. God didn't tell him where he was going. He didn't tell him quite the details of the promised land. He didn't really go into a lot of details at all. He just said, you're going to be blessed. And just like that, Abram packed up his stuff, he grabbed his wife, and they're on the road. He's 75. Now, for some of us at 75, for, for most of us, you've been retired for a few years. You, you're you're on that, that easy street of life where you're just taking it easy, you're just hanging out, you're just enjoying life. Now imagine 75, and you have to completely set everything aside. Your friends, your family, the things you spent the last 75 years building. You completely set that aside and follow God, a guy you know nothing about. You leave the, the comfortableness of a life that you've made that, that easy street that you thought, oh, this is just going to be easy. I'm just going to hang out. I'm going to hang down and go down to the Bucksaw. I'm going to have some coffee. And then 10 o'clock, I'm going to go over to my friend's house, have some more coffee. And then at noon, I'm going to have a roast. And then at 3, I'm going to have some more coffee. And at 5, I'm going to watch the news. And 6, I'm going to eat. And 7, I'm going to go to the bed. That's my picture of retirement right there. That's probably what Abram wanted, that comfortable life. And all of a sudden, God says, take everything that's comfortable and go with me. Set it all aside, all those hopes, all those dreams, and I will bless you. One day, there's this little boy, and he, he came running in to his home. And he's wearing this, this baseball outfit, the, the pants and the shirt, and he was just a little boy. 
And he come running in, and he had tears streaming down his face, and he runs up to his mother, and his mother says, well, what is wrong now? And the little boy said, I had my first little league game today. And his mother goes, yeah, I, I forgot. We, you know, we got busy around the house. How did your game go? How was little league? And the little boy, in tears, he said to his mom, I struck out three times, mom. And the mom, who was wise, she said, Son, that's part of life. Striking out is part of life. It'll happen. And the little boy said, Mom, Mom, I'm in T-ball. See, that's life. Sometimes when you think it's impossible to strike out, you strike out. Sometimes when you're comfortable, the uncomfortable happens. All of us experience mistakes in our lives. All of us have experienced failures that have, that have changed, that have made a ripple across not just your life, but, but everyone in the, your area's life. We've all experienced that little morsel of change that, that slowly gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We all commit sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. Even the most faithful people I know, even the people that, that I went to seminary with, and you see this, this special glow about them, you think, I wonder if this person really ever committed a sin in their life. They just seem so perfect. And then you get to know them, and you realize that, that even the most faithful, even the most holy people that you know have sinned, have fall short of the glory of God. That's in Scripture. We will all fall short of the glory of God. In this... The good and the godly are always imperfect as humans. The strong will always have weaknesses, and the heroes, the people that we look up to, can always and will always falter. A few weeks ago, I told you about one of my heroes, that, that one of my, my favorite football players. I thought, oh, this is just a godly man. This is the guy we want to look up to. And then I seen him swear on national TV. My hero, the guy I look up to, the godly guy, I think this is guy is just a great representative, let me down. Heroes will falter. God had went to Abraham and he had said, I have a promise for you. Something that is bigger than anything you can ever imagine. I have something for you. And you got to think Abraham at this time is saying, I'm just an ordinary man. I've sinned. I've done these things that you have told us not to do. I'm no better than Adam. I'm no better than Eve. So why? Why me? But by faith, he still followed. By faith, he picked up his things and he responded to the call that God had given to him. And that is the message to God's promise. Each and every one of us have been in Abraham's shoes where God has called us to do something that makes us uncomfortable, that takes us away from the comforts of the things that we have always known. And he said, come, come follow me. And you look back and you say, God, man, buddy, pal, I've always been comfortable doing this. I know my life. I know where this road is going, and I I'm okay with it. And God says, no, I will bless you. I will give you many blessings, things that you cannot imagine. Now, he wasn't specific in his blessings to Abraham. He just said, I will give you blessings. Those who know you will be blessed, and those who curse against you will be cursed. God is saying, I have your back. Abraham wasn't a perfect man. He wasn't this holy, godly person person who had never sinned but God had chose him and God said if you walk by faith if you follow me by faith you would be blessed God chose Abraham to establish his new covenant that we today still honor that we today still have inside of us he chose an ordinary man Abraham was filled with sin he was filled with fear he was filled with doubts he was just like each and every one of us he had two promises. God, God, why at 75 years of age have I still not had a son? Why have you made my wife not able to, bury, uh, to, to have a child? 
He had said that. He had said, God, why? He had doubted God, yet God still came to him with a promise. That is grace, friends. That is the grace that, that each and every one of us has here today. A promise that, that even when we doubt God, even when we sin, when we do the things that displeases God, that there's a promise still today that there's a bigger plan for each and every one of us. That we, each and every one of you, will be blessed. That is grace. Abraham didn't deserve to, to be given that, that, that calling. I didn't deserve this calling to, to be up here. Each and every one of you don't deserve the calling to be saved, but yet through grace, we are. Through grace, we are all given that promise. I read a story of this woman who, who was on one of these great big, um, like a, a carnival cruise ship, or a great big luxury cruiser, right? And one day she's on this cruise ship, and she's leaning close to the edge of the rail, to, to see something, and she falls off into the water. And soon, soon after she hits the water, an, another person is in right beside her. And that person swims over to her and, and grabs her. And they both begin to, to um, wade the waters together, to, to kick and to hold their weight up, cra- clasping on to one another. And soon a lifeboat floats up to them, and they, they get on the lifeboat, and they get back on the ship, and, and the, the man who, had, who had got, went into the water to, to go rescue this girl was the oldest man on the ship. The oldest guy, the, the most elderly on the ship, was the guy that was clenched around her to save her life. So they decided, hey, this guy's a hero. We're going to throw him a great grand party tonight. So, so that night, they, they got all cleaned up, and they got all dried off, and they got their suits on, and they get to this party, and the, the crowd going, speech, speech, speech. They want this elderly man to give a speech. So he walks up to the, to the podium or whatever, and he walks up there, and he grabs the microphone, and, and he looks angry at the crowd, and he, he gives them a, a look over looking for, for maybe a specific person. And you could tell there's, there's anger in his face, and he said, I'd like to know one thing. And he paused, and he looked at him angrily. Who pushed me in the water? See, that's our response. We're given a choice. You can either jump in or save it, or God will push you in. That's how our faith is. You can can either accept your faith and go in, or God, at some point in your life, He will push you in. Now, some of you, you've had that that easy part of your faith where where it's just always been there. And some of you have been pushed in by God. You've had events that, that maybe have changed your life, and God has just thrown you in and said, Hey, I tried this the easy way, and you weren't about saving. So here's the hard way. Get in the water. See, see, I have this, this firm belief. I, I can't remember. Um, I believe it was Wingley, but don't, don't quote me on this. He said, um, life is 10% of, of what we do. 10% of what happens in our life, of what we do. The other is 90% a response to what we do. Meaning 10% of the things that we do has some sort of response. Now think about your daily lives. The first thing that happens in life, in your day, is what? Work people, what happens first thing in the morning? Meh, meh, meh. Alarm goes off. Now, at that moment, you have two responses. Response one is what I do. Snooze. Boop. That's what I did three times this morning. My wife, she's the one that, like, the alarm goes off. She has to get up, usually. And, like, it drives her nuts when I hit snooze, especially when she's still sleeping. Because 30 minutes later, that snooze is still going off, right? The other response that we make is to get out of bed, to put one foot in front of the other and say, God, here's my day. To not hit that snooze button. Think about all the things in your life. The, the other thing that drives me nuts, let's pick on Ashley Day today. The other thing that drives me nuts is when I text my wife, who here has iPhones? Yeah, greatest thing ever made on iPhones, the read receipt. You can tell when they've read that message, and, and my wife, she disabled hers now. 
But I, it drives me nuts when I text someone and it says that they read my message and they didn't respond back. Or I send an email to consistory. And a week later, we get to consistory and everyone's, well, we didn't respond to the email. Why? I don't waste my time texting. I don't waste my time emailing. Or, or, or I call someone and they're jamming in their car and they, they, they know that they need to respond to my call. They've got to call me back. And three days later, I see them downtown. And I say, why did you call me back? Oh, I, I seen you called. Yeah, I didn't call for no reason. Every day we have a response to something. Every day we are called with little things. That's why 10% of our day is just, is just life. And 90% of our day is responding to the life around us. That. That is our life. Now that is what it's like to live in a covenant. God gave us something. He said, each and every day I'm presenting you with something that you have to respond to. Each and every day, 90% of your day, you're going to have to resp respond to my call to you. It isn't just a one time you pick up the phone and say, hey God, uh, I'm still here. And you don't hear from him for weeks. It's a constant, constant, 90% that you're responding to him. It's that first thing when the alarm goes off and you put your feet on the floor and you say, God, I got this day. It's that thing when, you, when you're driving to work and all of a sudden there's a deer on the road and you dodge that deer and you say, God, thank you. Thank you, God. Or it's that, that moment at work when a coworker comes over to you and you say, how was your weekend? And you say, oh, I had a great church service. Or I... I talked to a friend at church who was in need, oh, and I just had the greatest conversation with them. That is our response to what God gives us in grace. It is our response that, that causes us to do good works in our day. Our response to grace. That's when Abraham was given this promise, and he said, God said, all you've got to do is respond. All you've got to do with this promise I give you is follow me. That's what it's like to, to live in covenant. It's a, it's a promise freely given to us, a promise that, that in baptism that I give every child, or God gives every child, and I recite that promise, that before you were ever created, a promise was given to you, a promise that you will someday have to respond to. That is a covenant relationship. That is what baptism is 100% about, is that covenant, that someday you will make a response. And that every day after that, a response will be given to every action you make. To everything that you do, a response will happen. And you can either hit the snooze button and, and ignore that response, or you can get out of bed and live that day according to God's will. Today we receive this promise by grace. It's a promise freely given to us. We don't have to pack up our bags and we don't have to, to travel to a promised land in order to start a new nation. The promise can be given to us right here through faith in Christ. So I ask you, how will you respond? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I'm, I'm so thankful for, for your grace, for your, your promise given to each and every one of us that our generations will receive this promise and because of that promise, we respond. That through that promise, we are given the, the education and knowledge to, to know what faith is and how to walk in faith. And that someday, someday, maybe you'll push us out of the boat and say, respond. Heavenly Father, I ask that you help us respond. Help us respond each and every day in the forms of handshakes, of smiles, of, of caring stories, of hugs of just asking our kids and our loved ones, how was your day, and truly, truly being with them. Heavenly Father, I ask that you come. Help us do these things, because we cannot do them on our own. Amen. Like